So I want to talk generally about this talk, AI, uh, uh, AI alignment. So we've got a lot of terms floating around, AI safety, AI policy, value alignment. How do these things all uh, line up? Uh, and I want to give you a framework for thinking about that. I'm going to talk about a set of uh, research projects I'm involved in and some things I'd like to be involved in. So a lot of the conversation about AI safety is on the question of how should we regulate AI? Right? What, what are the right rules? What are the values we should? So anybody who's like been bored to tears by the trolley problem, right? And sitting around like, what are, what are the values? That's a lot of the conversation in AI ethics, uh, liability for autonomous vehicles, for uh, autonomous weapons, et cetera. Uh, it's about what should, uh, what should the rules be? How should we? I want to focus and say actually the really, really big and interesting and hard problem is how can we regulate AI? How can we actually get machines to do the things that we want uh, them to do? And that's a, that's a tough question. And I think the way to think about that is to think about how can you build AI systems that can interface with what I call human normative systems. It's an important concept. Um, normativity, I'm going to use that uh, language to mean the systems that humans have for classifying behavior as sanctionable or not. That's basically every single human society you look at is going to be full of normative labels. This is an okay action, that is not an okay action. Everything about social norms, culture, uh, law boils down to a classification system, a normative classification system. This is okay, that's not okay. And then on top of that, an enforcement scheme for punishing people who engage in the not okay thing. And I actually think this is one of the most exciting and fascinating things about human evolution is the development of these normative systems. And I want us to be focused on thinking about that. And I want to just draw a distinction here because uh, a lot of our work on thinking about how do we make sure that robots and AIs do what we want them to do focuses on the idea of preferences. I'm an economist, I love the idea of preferences, but preferences are a modeling tool. I don't think, there is no such thing as preferences. It's a way of modeling actions. Um, and so I'll throw that out there and I'd love anybody who wants to talk about preferences and the difference between thinking about this. There's a difference between analyzing human normative systems and thinking about human preferences or values. So I wanna just draw that distinction. It's not. Um, uh, and focus on the idea of systems, which is also means there's a lot more information out there for us to use to extract from the environment what is it that's okay and not okay to do. Um, I want to think about this as, as both an engineering research program, how do you build these kinds of systems, and it's a social science research program because frankly there's very little work done on analysis of those normative systems. Um, and I think those things need to be integrated, and that's why I'm really excited to be talking to you about this work and uh, hopefully opening up some uh, research programs. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk uh, about five lines of research. The first two I'll talk about in some detail, and the last three I'll just kind of hit them to say these are additional things I'm just getting started on, would like to get started on, would love to talk to you about. Um, so uh, let's talk about this first one, designing reward structures, and this is as Marzia mentioned, this is uh, work with, with Dylan. Um, uh, and it's really giving a, a, an overview um, framework for thinking about AI alignment. So how many of you have seen this little video? Oh, not, not so many. Okay, so this is out of OpenAI. Uh, they trained this um, um, AI to play this uh, video game. It is a boat racing game which you may not be able to tell because that boat has not learned to win the race. It has learned to get points because that's the reward function they gave it. So you can watch down here the score is going crazy. What did it learn? It learned that if you just roll over those, those turbo boost spots in there, you get lots of points, but you never win the game. And they have this as posted as uh, an example of how, I mean, they thought they were choosing a pretty good reward function for the system to learn how to play the game, uh, but this is what it's learning how to do. Uh, so a great example of the reward design problem. Um, here's another example from uh, other work of, of Dylan's with uh, Smith & Millie, Peter Abiel, Stuart Russell, and Akka Dragan, the last three of which are his advisors at Berkeley. Um, uh, and this is a, a paper that Dylan presented last year at NIFS, inverse reward design. 
thinking here about the kind of problem, you suppose you have a, a designer who wants to uh, train a robot to go find pots of gold in a little grid world uh, and to, to optimize the path, choosing between going over grass, which is costly, and taking a path, which is less, a paved path, which is less costly. Um, the designer sets up this, this uh, reward function. It's really a proxy reward function, trains the robot, sends it out in the world, but oops, out in the world there is lava. And the robot knows nothing. There's nothing in the reward function that the designer specified that takes account of the lava. But of course, she does actually have a prefer preference over lava. It's really bad to go through lava. Um, how, can, how can you, but you can't, if you can't always anticipate everything that's going to be out there in the environment, you're going to have this problem of designing these reward functions that just don't take account of things that you're going to discover out there in the real world that you really do care about. So it's the idea that your reward function is not really your reward function, and they have a solution that's basically treating this as an observation from the distribution of possible reward functions. OK, so that's a way of thinking about the reward design problem, and that's a way of thinking about misalignment. Misalignment between the reward function here that the uh, the AI is, uh, uh, is training to achieve, and the true reward function, the true values for the um, humans involved. Um, whoops, I'm going to say, let's see. OK, so I want, here's the point I want to make. So my PhD is in economics. Misalignment between individual and social welfare functions is like what all of economics is about. That's basically what we do. So when Dylan and I start talking about this stuff, we start having conversations. I was visiting at Harvard, and he was finishing up at MIT. I was saying, OK, so you're talking about these issues you're studying. And I'm saying, well, that sounds pretty darn familiar. Um, we have things in we have the first theorem of uh, welfare economics, uh, which tells us that perfect and complete markets, in which individuals are just maximizing their individual profit function, utility function, can achieve alignment with a social welfare function. That's just a basic result. We have a whole field of uh, principal agent analysis, which is precisely focused on the problem of how does a principal who delegates a task to an agent get the agent to behave in the ways that the principal wants the agent to behave. Um, and then we have a, a long line of work on what to do about the fact that those, um, uh, those contracts between the principal and the agent will invariably be incomplete and won't capture everything. So this is what I was doing when I was a grad student. I was thinking about franchising. Sounds like a weird thing, but anyway. Um, and I was thinking about, I was doing contract theory and bargaining theory, game theory, and we were thinking about the problem of, OK, so McDonald's over here has things it wants to accomplish. It's got values associated with licensing its trademark to franchisees, and it's got value it gets from franchisees putting effort into a task and from uh, you know, building its market through new products that it puts out there, you know, the Frappuccinos and so on. Uh, the franchisee over here has uh, values associated with those things that are different from the ones that the principal have, in particular the, print, the agent here is bearing costs. Um, now if, if they could write a complete contingent contract that addressed all possible circumstances and specify the rewards for the agent, they could align those in interests so that they maximize the joint profit function between them. Right? So there would be an optimal amount of effort. There's an optimal amount of new Frappuccino and products to introduce at some rate, given the cost. If they could write what economists think of as a complete contingent contract addressing every possible circumstance, they could achieve the optimum. They could maximize joint, joint welfare. But here's what people were starting to realize way back when, when I was starting my PhD, was that uh, those contracts invariably are incomplete. It's really hard to write a contract specifying effort for the franchisee. It's a hard to measure thing. Uh, it's really hard to write a contract specifying how often the franchisor should require new investments in new products and so on. So those contracts are invariably incomplete. And they, uh, they exist in an environment where they're filled in by two kinds of mechanisms or institutional settings. So here's my little symbol for courts. So for example, this contract, it's incomplete. It's got lots of ambiguity. Uh, but you might think that has an implied in it that the franchisor has to be acting good faith in deciding when to require these new products. 
and that good faith means you can't just extract from the franchisee. Franchisees locked in, made all these investments. You can't just extract the value you couldn't have gotten up front. Um, and you might have courts that enforce that, but you might also have the community that's enforcing that. So get, McDonald's getting a bad reputation and having a harder time getting new franchisees, or the franchisee getting a bad reputation or getting terminated. So this is my little symbol for informal or community enforcement. So that's the world in which those complete contracts live. Um, and the message that economists were getting right about then was, if we're going to analyze contracts, analyzing incomplete contracts is fundamental. And I think there's a similar message for uh, people working in CS on d doing reward design, is to say, look, mis misspecification of rewards is not just a glitch, not, oh, you know, OpenAI, the folks who designed that um, uh, boat racing algorithm should have just been smarter and written a better reward function, to say, look, no, misspecification is the state of play. And, and we need to think about how do you manage that. It's unavoidable and pervasive. Uh, Satinder Singh has been writing about this for a little while, talking about optimal reward design, sort of figuring out what's the best way to do that. So I want to think a little bit about why are contracts incomplete. Um, economists have done a lot of work on this. What are the reasons for incompleteness? Well, there's bounded rationality. You can't think of all the contingencies. Uh, there's costly cognition and drafting. Uh, there's what we call non-contractability. You can't write all those contracts and then hand, there's, there, you can't explain to courts everything you want them to know and if the court is your enforcement mechanism, it's going to be incomplete for that reason. Uh, we've got strategic behavior. I don't want to mention certain things that might happen. The franchisor doesn't want to mention them. I don't want to mention them. So they don't end up in the contract because we don't want to talk about them. Uh, we could plan to renegotiate. We know we'll know more later. So let's not try and get everything up front right now. Let's start our relationship and figure things out later. Uh, we can plan to write vague and, um, and gaps terms and then delegate to a third party to fill it in later with better information. So that's the set of reasons that economists have looked at for why contracts are incomplete. And I think you can basically write down the same set of reasons for why reward structures might be misspecified, bounded rationality, uh, costly engineering and design, uh, non-implementability, which is what we think is sort of the analog to non-contractability, just machine learning problems we haven't figured out how to solve yet. Um, adversarial design might be an analogy to strategic behavior. Not so sure about that one yet. Uh, it may be that, in fact, you want to design something where there's a planned iteration on rewards. You're going to have an initial reward. You're going to update that reward later. Uh, and maybe we should even be thinking about planned completion of rewards by third parties. So I think there's this, this analogy that we can uh, line up between uh, why contracts are incomplete and why rewards are misspecified. Um, now what we do in this little paper is we go through the, the insights from the economic theory literature that are possible, we're just kind of throwing out there. Here's some possible things that you might take from the results that we have in the economic literature. I'm just going to very quickly mention a couple. So for example, there's the analysis of property rights in this literature. That says sometimes the best thing to do is, um, uh, instead of trying to more finely retune your contract, it may just be better if you've, you're a principal and you've got an agent running your firm, it may just be better to sell the firm to the agent. That's transferring property rights to the agent. Um, what's important about that is to recognize that selling the, fir the, a the uh, firm to the agent, creating this property, is just a transformation of the utility function. That's all that it means. This is, so if we're going to think about what this might mean in the AI context, uh, and this really is speculative, um, it's not about giving robots property rights, but it is about thinking about whether or not the utility function, the reward function, has to address more than the specific task that you're trying to accomplish. Do you need to give that agent rewards that go beyond the specific task that you're thinking about uh, it performing? Um, another uh, set of results in this literature on measurement and multitasking, uh, sometimes a basic result showing that sometimes it's optimal to reduce the incentives on measured tasks when there are important tasks that are not measured as well. Uh, and the usual example is thinking about teaching. If you want to both uh, have your students acquire knowledge, but also gain creativity and resilience and so on, well, we can measure their knowledge pretty well with standardized tests. We can't measure the success with which we're imparting creativity and resilience to them. And so it may say, look, you actually don't want to um, uh, optimize your 
let's see. I think I jumped back too far. Um, so it may be you actually don't want to include this easily measurable information in the reward structure for the teacher if it's going to distort things from the things you can't measure, which I think might also be something to think about in the AI context. Um, and I'm really nervous with Uber next door to say anything at all about how this applies in self-driving cars. But anyway, uh, you can think about it. We can think, but the idea is that you know, if you find, t if you sort of, it's, it's a natural thing to think. I've got this information. I should make the greatest use of it. But if there's stuff you can't measure, you may be better off dialing back how you're using your measurable stuff and not going to the max on that one. Uh, we also talk in the paper about theory insights for what we call st strongly strategic AI, thinking here of AI that can change its utility function or change its hardware and so on. We're not gonna, I'm not going to go through that, but you can take a look at the paper if you're interested. Um, the, the thing I really want to emphasize are uh, insights from the, uh, the legal theory of incomplete contracting. Um, and I realize I'm going to have to keep track of my time here. Um, so one of the basic insights we get in the 80s is this idea that contracts come embedded in uh, institutional and social structures. Granovetter is a sociologist. We get the development of something called the relational contracts approach, um, emphasizing that contracts consist not only of their expressed terms, but also of their uh, interpreted and implied terms. So, uh, and those are supplied by law and relational norms. So let me sort of talk about why I think this might be interesting to think about in the AI context. So this is an example of, uh, from a great paper um, out of OpenAI, um, uh, Concrete Problems in AI Safety, if you're interested. Uh, so they posit, here's a basic problem. You train a robot to uh, carry boxes to the other side of the room. It's got a, it gets a reward for getting boxes to the other side of the room. You train it for that. Uh, then you release it out into the world, and oops, there's a vase that appears on the path. So what, this is, this is like the lava problem. What is the robot going to do uh, when that, with that, well, a robot doesn't have any information about vase is going to just plow straight through the vase because its reward structure says there's zero there. So, okay, that, and, and they present this as a problem saying, okay, how are you going to develop robots that can figure out, as they would say, kind of common sense. I think let's, let's see if we can dig into common sense a bit more structurally. So imagine you have a human agent who's got the same job. And they've got a contract that's exactly the same as the robot's reward function. They're going to get paid for boxes on the other side of the room. Um, and so we're going to hire this agent. We're going to leave the agent alone in the room to carry the boxes. And then the vase is going to appear in the path that the, the agent has gotten used to using going across the room. Uh, what's the agent going to do, the human agent? going to go around the vase. And the question is why? Why is the human going to go around the vase? And we don't want to get mushy. We don't want to get just like, oh, it's, that's just being human. And that's just common sense. We've got to figure out what that looks like. How do humans do it? What makes co incomplete contracting rational? Why is it rational for the principal to leave that agent in the room and not worry too much about the vase showing up uh, in the path? Well, the way to think about this, I think, is to think about the fact that this contract here is not the entire contract. That's the express terms in the contract. The human agent is going to think, huh, see this vase? If I take my usual path, I'm going to knock it over. And then what's going to happen? Well, you know, the employer might sue me, might take me to court and get me for property damages. My employ employment law may allow the employer to deduct from my wages the cost of the broken vase. Or I may just get a really bad reputation. I won't get a good recommendation from this employer. Uh, my coworkers may snicker at me. I will bear some kind of a cost for knocking over the vase. So the true contract is R minus C, the cost for knocking over the vase. And the agent is able to fill that in by reference to this external structure and go around the vase. And this is the key point. The human contracts rely on a ton of external structure. Nobody solves this problem entirely mathematically inside the box. That's the basic insight of how you solve the incomplete contracting problem. You've got to bring in stuff from the outside. Um, and I'm a, I teach contract law when I'm over at the law school, so if you'd like to know more about that, I'm happy to talk about it. We bring stuff in from the outside. So I think one of the questions is, can we build AIs that can similarly fill in their reward functions can we build them so that they're able to uh, replicate that human process of reading and then predicting the classification of behavior in our human normative systems, right? The 
the external structure I'm appealing to here is a system. It's out there. It's not just somebody's preferences. It's a system that's out there. And can we get them to assign negative weight to uh, actions classified as sanctionable? So can we build those kind? I think we have to figure out how to build those kinds of systems. Um, all right, let me uh, now talk a little bit about this line of work on modeling human normativity, also with Dylan. Uh, this is a paper on which we've, I think, titled, we've, we've roamed around a lot, Legible Normativity for AI Alignment, the Value of Silly Rules. Okay. So remember I just said, we are, can, we, can we build AIs to replicate the human process of reading and predicting the classification of behavior in human normative systems? Well, to do that, if we're going to, if we're, they're going to need, if we're going to make predictions about how human normative systems will respond to specific actions, you're going to need good models of those human normative systems. And this is when I really get worried about this line of work because hardly anybody is working on this from the social science perspective. Um, the focus in a lot, we have lots of people working on norms and law you know, throughout the university. We have people in psychology, sociology, law, working on economics, working on norms. But the focus tends to be on the substance of particular norms. So we have behavioral economics, running experiments, playing those dictator or uh, ultimatum games, and coming up with a result that gets expressed as 30% of people have a preference for fairness, and they'll reject an unfair offer in an ultimatum game. Right? Now, that's not telling us how these systems work. That is telling us that there is this fairness norm, and we're not looking at how do those systems work. I think it's also causing us a problem because a critical feature of human normativity is its arbitrary, its capacity for arbitrary content. As a group of humans, we can effectively put anything we want into our norms. And if we can coordinate all of us to say we won't deal with that person if they wear the wrong clothing or if they say the wrong thing, right, or if they don't contribute this amount to our joint project, we can establish that as a norm. And this is actually, I think, why we invent normativity, precisely because it's capable of taking arbitrary content, not meaningless content, but arbitrary content in order to adapt to different environments. So I think one of the things we have to recognize about modeling human normative systems is we don't want to really model the specific content in specific settings. We want to look at the attributes of those systems. Um, so this is the point we're going to have to uh, they can't just be given the rules because there's not a list of norms that are out there in, 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 across cultures, across geography, across settings, across time, in future uh, worlds. Uh, we're going to have to uh, help figure out what are the predictive basis for figuring out what are the rules that are actually enforced and in play in any given uh, environment. It's a project I've been working on with co-author uh, Barry Weingast, who's a uh, political scientist at Stanford. We've got a series of papers on this. Um, and what we're looking at are what are the attributes of rule systems that help to coordinate and incentivize third-party decentralized punishment. We have classifications of behavior. This is okay, that's not okay. And then the challenge is how do you coordinate enforcement of that? Centralized classification, uh, centralized enforcement, you know, the police, the government, prisons, and so on. Very, it's, it's very rare, it's very uh, new in human societies, and it's also only playing a very small fraction of the enforcement behavior, even in, even in settings like contracts. Most contracts are enforced by the fact that if people find out you breach your contract, they don't want to do business with you. And that's what drives a lot of uh, compliance with contracts. So we emphasize that if you're trying to analyze that system, a key uncertainty that anybody is facing in a setting is to understand, getting a handle on the likelihood that others will participate in punishing somebody who violates the rule. We need to know, okay, even if these rules are announced, are people actually going to be enforcing them? And so a key uncertainty in any setting is what rules are being enforced by others. Again, very distinctive about human societies, third party punishment, right? We say, so-and-so was uh, rude to my colleague. I don't want to ask so-and-so to join my research team. 
right? So and so, you know, behaved badly with uh, uh, with my family member. I'm not going to, um, uh, you know, recommend them for a job, right? We've 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 engaged in third party uh, enforcement. And understanding when and how that's going to happen is a key problem that humans are solving all the time. All right, so what this project does is it looks at what we call silly rules. Uh, and silly rules, we just mean by silly rules, and it's a deliberately provocative name, rules that actually have no value directly in and of themselves. A lot of our rules about clothing, about food, about particular words that we use, things you can say or not say in this setting, uh, you could think of them as silly rules. Now, it's really important. People who are experiencing the rules don't experiencing them. Don't experience them as silly. They think they're very important. Um, but I want to define a silly rule as one um, where uh, there's no direct impact. It's only we want to know what's the function it's performing. Uh, so I want to say what's important about this for AI is uh, we want to say, okay, here's something you might need to understand that we don't currently understand about the way our normative systems work. And it will be important if we're going to build AIs that can interact in those normative systems that we have good models of this. So this is where you can think of this as an example to prove my main point, which is we need people interested in this problem of aligning AIs with human normative systems to also be engaging in much more careful research about how human normative systems work. Okay, so uh, we do this, we give you an example to get started. Imagine dropping a robot, ah, uh, yes, sorry. I'm going to give you some right now. And I'm going to do it in a dangerous context, okay? So we're going to drop a robot down among the Awa of Brazil. And we're going to, we, we want this robot to figure out how to build arrows. This is something that uh, the men among the Awa uh, spend a lot of time doing, making, making arrows. Um, and uh, part of the reason I want to use this setting is precisely because it, it seems kind of odd to think about dropping a robot into this environment to learn how to make arrows, but it's not really all that much sillier, crazier than dropping a robot into Toronto and saying learn how to drive, right? It's just that we are so immersed in the world of, uh, of Toronto and how to drive that's very hard for us to sort of pay attention a little to what might, be, what might be going on in the structure rules. I think this is a real challenge uh, for doing this kind of work because we have so many, we're in, we are participants in these systems, much harder for us to get outside of them. Okay, so um, here's, here's the kinds of things that this robot is going to observe. And I'm just, so uh, it's going to observe that there's actually a bunch of rules about making arrows. Um, those of you who don't know, this is Hammurabi's code, my little symbol for a set of rules. Hammurabi's code is not 287 independent rules, it's 287 rules carved into a seven-foot pillar of stone and stuck into the, uh, the central square uh, in ancient Babylon. Okay, so it's a set of rules. So you're going to see things like use hardwood for the shaft, uh, use bamboo arrowheads, put feathers on the end of the arrow, use only dark feathers, smoke the arrows over a fire at all times while they are active. An un an, a non-active arrow is one that's been bundled up and put in the rafters. So this is just an arrow that might be used. So keep it over the fire. Keep it warm. Don't let it get cold. Uh, make, and, make and use only personalized arrows. Uh, make them 1.4 to 1.7 meters long. And make and carry as many more arrows than you're going to use. OK, so that's what you'd observe in terms of the rules. These are actually enforced rules about how to make arrows. Here's what else our robot will observe. Uh, men in this society spend over four hours a day uh, making arrows. Uh, in one season, they carried 402 on their trips, and they used nine of them. And because they get bundled up and so many get carried together, they get damaged. So a bunch of the four and a plus hours is actually repairing the damage that's done from making and carrying so many and, then, and not really using them. Uh, they actually use shotguns to uh, uh, shoot most of the stuff that they're out after. Uh, this is a, a tribe that's living in close proximity to developed community societies. So they're, but, they're, uh, but the man who makes his arrows differently is mocked and shunned. They make a lot of fun of him for, here's uh, sort of an example of what I'm going to call a silly rule, use only dark feathers. He uses colorful feathers on his arrows. He doesn't use, they're, they're too long. 
They're the wrong length. Um, he doesn't, maybe he doesn't keep, I don't know if this is true, uh, maybe he doesn't keep them warm. So we have a whole bunch of rules, but not all of these rules are functionally related to accomplishing the objective of catching prey. So what Dylan and I did was we um, did a computational experiment and uh, we, um, let's see, did I lose a slide here? Yeah, okay, so uh, I, I think I've lost a slide in here. I, I wanted to emphasize, I don't know exactly which of these are silly, but I'm pretty sure the colored feathers, the keeping them warm over the fire, um, making and using only personalized arrows, that may have benefits for other settings, but you know, because of the social consequences of not using personalized arrows, but you know, an arrow is an arrow, doesn't matter who made it. Uh, and this one seems to be a bit silly for sure because making and carrying many more hours than arrows than you're use, using is just creating costs. Um, okay, so what is we ran a computational experiment. We, we put together communities of 100 agents uh, in a group and the group is defined by a rule set. Those of you who are thinking about group identity and so on, I think this is a way of thinking about what group identity means is what, it, what does it mean to be a member of this group? I follow this set of rules about what I eat, what I wear, how I treat people, marriage, etc. cetera. Uh, and we're gonna have members of that group engage in a sequence of interactions. And you just wanna think about this like three person games being randomly drawn in the sequence. Um, and, and the rules are being randomly drawn from that group's rule set, okay? Um, now, we're gonna imagine that there are, in this set of rules, there are some silly rules, but there are also some important rules. So the important rules might be, don't steal people's stuff. Um, keep your contract promises. Don't harm others. There might be some important rules in the environment, but there's also going to be silly rules, and they were just thinking about, they're all in that set. Uh, and we want to imagine that there's high value to being in this group with these important rules. Suppose you're the first group to figure out that protecting property will improve economic uh, performance. Uh, there's high value to group membership if and only if those important rules are enforced. So if everybody says, hey, join our group, we protect private property, sounds great, but then you're gonna leave your private property unattended, you're, not gonna, you're gonna leave your stuff unattended. And that will be great because you can go off and do productive things while you leave it unattended if other people are in fact enforcing that rule. But you're gonna lose if in fact nobody's really enforcing that rule, right? So what will matter is people have told me this is the rule. I need to know whether or not this group is actually enforcing it. And that's the key uncertainty for our agents in this model is the uncertainty is about what's the percentage of punishers in this group. Are there enough people around willing to punish violators that I've got a, a, a decent chance that if I walk away from my stuff, the don't steal people's stuff rule will be enforced. The important rules, and I'll get the payoff rather than the cost associated with that. So you wanna think about that's the variable the agent doesn't know is the percentage of punishers in the group. And we wanna think about our agents in a sequence just having to continue to decide period by period whether or not to stay with the group or to go off to some alternative, say, you know, their island on their own. Okay, where they can maybe secure, a, a, uh, they can secure, uh, well, we could just zero it out, uh, pay off. You know, they, they wanna know, is there a high, so it's obviously got the structure of a, uh, a bandit game. Um, and what we do here is we then vary, we have multiple groups. And what we do is vary across the groups. It's a percentage of rules in the set that are silly rules. We hold constant the number or the rate at which important games come along, you know, possibilities that somebody will steal your stuff, right? But we're going to basically insert in, so here's our blue is the uh, important games. We're just gonna vary the number of silly games you play along the way, okay? So we have a, a low, low density uh, here in the top row and then a higher density down here in the bottom. Okay, so uh, we're thinking about our robot example. We're thinking the question for the robot is which rules should the robot learn to follow? Just these ones, I'm gonna call these the important rules. As I say, I don't know, I don't make arrows, but I'm just guessing. 
uh, or the full set that seems to include these silly rules. Well, that's very much like the problem that humans are facing all the time, right? Which group is better? Which group should I stay with? You can think about those Awa Indians, actually. They are having to decide, should I stay with my community in this area, or should I go to town and join, integrate into the rest of Brazilian society? So that's a question about which group am I in? Uh, we're going to measure the value of group membership, the size of the community over time, and the sensitivity of uh, the stability of those metrics to the cost and density of silly rules. Uh, and then we're going to look at this in the context of uh, a belief shock where all of a sudden all the population thinks, oh, wait a second, there's a, let's suppose there's, a, there's an influx of new members, immigrants to the group, and we don't know about them. We don't know if they enforce the rules or not. Right? We think maybe they do, but we're not sure. So that's a belief shock, and it's a belief shock if there's actually not really any change in the population. The people, the newcomers, are just as likely to be punishers as the old timers. But we're also going to look at a population shock uh, where, in fact, there's, a there's been a change. The newcomers actually don't enforce at the same rate. Okay? So our hypotheses here are that groups with more silly rules are more likely to survive shocks to beliefs, like immigration, or, uh, like I said, those could be uh, the changes. And that groups with more silly rules will collapse faster in response to a shock to uh, the truth of the population, uh, which is actually when it's optimal. You don't want to continue in a group if the group's rules are not being enforced. You might, like, you might wish they would be, but if they're not, you don't want to stay. It's inefficient to do that. So I'll just show you a couple of pictures here. From uh, This is first just showing the impact on the, the uh, vertical axis here. Is this is the proportion of communities that are active. And this is the number of, we call it an interaction. It's every, every member of the group has interacted and had at least one, had one important interaction. So in some of these cases, they've also had a bunch of silly interactions, but important ones. And what this is showing up here um, in the top left is that when we have our cost, um, it, it's, you want to think of that as a, as a rel here it's a relatively low cost. Almost all those societies survive. You can't see the orange ones, which are the, the orange, sorry, the orange ones are the, uh, the communities that have uh, at the very bottom zero silly rules. They just have important rules, which is probably the society you'd say you'd rather live in. I don't want to live in the society with silly rules. I want to live in the one that just worries about the important stuff. The blue ones are the ones that have high density of lots of silly rules. Um, so this is just showing, first of all, as from the, from the left, as the cost of uh, those silly rules, because you have to help participate in enforcing silly rules if you're going to be a member of this community. As that cost goes up, what you see is that the, the, high, the, the societies with lots of silly rules uh, collapse uh, faster. Uh, eventually, we get even the, the no ones, the no silly rules do. OK, so here's the results when we get the belief shock. And this is just showing that the size of the circle is the size of the community, the size of the group. Uh, again, this is the proportion that are still active, that don't collapse. And so we can see is that, the, this, this, which is our prediction, that the societies with more silly rules are more stable. They stay bigger and they don't collapse. We've still got almost 70% of them uh, surviving. If we have an actual population shock, though, again, our Societies with lots of silly rules collapse much faster than our societies with fewer silly rules. So what's the point about there of all this? This is a, that a world with lots of low cost uh, and predictive silly rules. Because what's important here is that when I observe you punishing a silly rule, that's predictive of you're punishing the rules. So that I can predict that you are a punisher of the important stuff as well which is actually where this project started out, which is saying, why do we do things like take 270, 87 rules and stick them on a single thing and call it Hammurabi's code? Because now all I need to know is, are you enforcing the code? I don't need to know, are you enforcing rule 42 and 76 and 112? Which, when I first started thinking about this, the reason I started talking to Dylan is that seems like a computationally very difficult problem, and here's a solution. Let's put it all in one thing and somehow create the belief structure that that's the same thing. 
Okay, so in terms of connection to uh, AI, AIs may need to read, follow, and help enforce silly as well as functional rules, and therefore AI research also needs more and better models of normativity. So that was just really as an example for that. Okay, um, how much, I've got about five or 10 minutes? Yeah, okay. All right, so all I'm gonna do is, I, I'm just gonna give a very quick uh, uh, teaser of projects that I either wanna work on, started to work on, um, or um, have got further on, but still, still working on, just very quickly here. So I think there's some great work to be done in modeling norms in multi-agent settings. Some of you may know this paper out of DeepMind, uh, which uh, used a multi-agent um, learning model to look what happens, what really happens. Do you know the, the common pool problem, the idea that uh, if, if humans have a resource that they all have access to, fishing, apples in the orchard, uh, there'll be something called the tragedy of the commons unless you create some kind of structure because everybody individually will go consume too much of the fish and the fish won't reproduce and will kill off the, the fish or will eat too many of the apples before they have a chance to reproduce. Um, uh, so what they did was they developed, they, they looked at a community for this um, and, and ran this, but they ran it with the following technology. They gave all of the agents the capacity, like a laser tag, that they could, they could tag other agents and take them out of the competition for the resource. I think they, they, they talk about it as apples. Uh, take them out of competition for 25 steps. So that they basically, I can, I, I can reduce the number of people going after the apples. And then you just see what happens in these communities. What did these agents learn to do? And they, uh, they argue there are three uh, phases. Um, uh, there's what they call the naive phase, the tragic phase, and the mature phase here for these societies. This is number of episodes. Um, and here what they're measuring on the, on the vertical axis, they've got measures of social welfare. Okay, and the first one here is efficiency, which is just average reward per agent. And the second one is peacefulness, the number of steps uh, with untagged agents or converse. So, so when this starts going down here, that's more use of the laser tag, right? People are getting tagged more often. And so what, what, they're, what they're showing here is that the agents actually learn, they, have a, they, they actually don't, first of all, don't realize they should be racing around for this stuff and they're doing pretty well. Then they figure out they better race around and grab the stuff before anybody else. Um, and so we get this is the, the collapse of the resource. The resource replenishes every episode, uh, but this is the collapse of it. Uh, and then over time they start to figure out the tagging and they, take their start, they start tagging uh, the other agents. And so the average reward for each agent goes up because the effective population is going down. And that's what's showing up in the peacefulness. The, they're, very, they're not using the laser tags at all, basically at the beginning, and then they start using them. So I really like this line of work and I think there's a ton to be done uh, developing this because this is not actually a solution to the common. Th these agents have not figured out a solution to the common pool problem. They're all acting on purely private incentives. They each, they're generating externality, but they're only shooting because it's benefiting them. And so what I'd like to see is whether or not we can embed a model of coordination of decentralized punishment of an arbitrary norm. Like somebody gets up and says 10 Right, can we figure out how to coordinate punishment of anybody who does more than 10? Because that's what human societies figure out how to do. Is there a way to model that? And can we model the emergence of classification of novel behaviors? So if somebody has a new way of collecting apples, right, can, how, do, how does that get labeled? Um, okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's aspirational. Uh, I'm not working with anybody on that, but I'd love to um, talk more about it. Um, Here's a project that I'm just getting started on and uh, with two great uh, undergrads from the computer science department who are both here, Victor Kwan and Rijan An. Uh, we've just started working on this. It's also with Dylan. Um, you can think about this as thinking about uh, related to questions about interpretability and fairness in algorithms, but it's from a very, very different starting point. And one of the starting points is when can we think about holding a human responsible for the decisions of an algorithm? Um, can we develop a procedure for basically, we want to think about this as licensing an algorithm. 
uh, before use that ensures that the algorithm's decisions can be justified consistently with rules and principles supplied by a relevant human community. And the thing we really want to emphasize here is that the decisions of algorithms in a lot of cases involve judgments. Right? You've got easy cases, hard cases, and you, uh, easy cases on either side. Clearly uh, answer A, clearly answer B. And then we've got cases where we're not sure, should we do A or B? Um, the other thing we emphasize here, and this is a distinction between, say, the interpretability research, it's not about can we figure out what's happening causally inside the algorithm. Humans need reasons for decisions. So if a bank is going to deny somebody a loan uh, using an algorithm, the way we regulate that in human societies is we have a set of reasons that are acceptable for that. Your credit score was low, the prospects for your bank according to an, for your project according to a bank were low, right? We have reasons that are not acceptable. Uh, I had a bad day, uh, you're a woman, um, uh, you're not my nephew, right? There, there, there could be all the, the, there are reasons they're not, that's how legal systems work. We put people on the stand to say, we think that you were redlining in that neighborhood in your mortgages and we require that there be reasons provided. So it could be that you have internally within an organization the desire to do this, or you could have a government that wants to be able to say, we need to be sure this algorithm is behaving in a way that can be integrated into our human systems of providing reasons, which is different from explaining necessarily what's happening inside the algorithm. So what we're trying to figure out if we can do, and we're so early in this, it's all, I, was, I, wrote, I sent D Dylan an email saying, can I even put this up? Is this too risky? Okay, so uh, we're not quite sure. But what we're trying to think about is can we find an, a data set? Can we do something like uh, create a dress code um, in which there are things, that, clothing that's allowed, clothing that's not allowed with some intermediate cases that are hard to judge? Could we uh, imagine uh, training algorithms on a biased set of labels and some on uh, fair labels? And fair here would just be that's a good faith implementation of the rules that say, you know, it can't, you can wear a t-shirt, but it can't have an offensive slogan. Okay, well, we're going to have to decide what's an offensive slogan. Um, and then what we want to think about is, so this is now the procedure for the licensing. You develop your algorithm, you give the human, a, a human, a different human than the original labeler, a chance to uh, work with the algorithm, learn about how it works, play with it. And then you say, okay, human, we're going to give you a test set. You have to be able to predict the classification that the algorithm will provide with some set level of accuracy because you're going to delegate to this algorithm a decision and it need, you need to be able to reasonably conf, with reasonable confidence predict what it will do. And human, for any decisions in that, in that test set, um, you will need to provide valid reasons for the decision. This T-shirt is offensive because it uses word that, words that don't show up in, the, in Webster's. They only show up in the urban dictionary, the slang dictionary, for example. Right? Uh, and what we would like to see is, that, first of all, can you even do this? Can you connect reasons to the algorithm? Um, does it make sense? Um, and does the procedure pass the fair algor algorithm and fail the biased one? Um, so we're trying to think how could you integrate this so that then if somebody, you release that algorithm, it start making, making, loan, making loan decisions, and somebody comes along and says the algorithm's made a decision that uh, violates the rules governing loan giving in this society, can you put the human on the stand basically to provide reasons consistent with the ones that were given in the, in the original test set? So new, well, I'm happy to talk about it. Last thing, very quickly. Um, uh, this is on building regulatory markets, or what I call super regulation. Uh, and I'm working on this with folks in, in the policy group at OpenAI. I also talk about it in my book, if you're interested, uh, Rules for a Flat World. Um, so this is our standard picture of how we regulate. We have governments uh, that establish rules governing what regulated entities can do. So down here we've got our banks and Facebook and Uber and so on. And we have command, most of that, our traditional model is command and control regulation. Here's what the car can do, here's what it can't do, here's what the bank can do, here's what it can't do. And all that de detail is supplied by governments. And I don't think we can ever build the capacity in governments to regulate 
particularly powerful AI systems. I don't think we can regulate what we have now. Um, never mind AI, global, complex, and so on. And so what I'm uh, working, again, talking with, working with OpenAI on this as well, is can we figure out how to develop a alternative model for developing this regulation uh, where we say, okay, government, you're gonna move out of the role of creating the rules. You're gonna move into the role of regulating regulators. You're gonna establish outcomes that regulators have to achieve and can we create, so these folks in here are private entities. They could be profit-making companies. They could be nonprofits. But the point, the key point is they can attract investment and brains. They can compete with the Ubers and the Facebooks and uh, the universities for smart people to invent methods and deliver methods for regulating the behavior of these regulated entities. I just throw that up there. I'm happy to talk to you, anybody about it that wants. And I'm done. Thank you.